Welcome to the third video of hyponatremia. The last two videos we spent significant amount of time trying to understand how is our body keep the sodium concentration at 135 to 140 sorry 145 milli equivalent of sodium per liter of water. How does the body keep it at that range? Now I think it's a good time to move to the problem that we're going to encounter in the hospital. Now you are a resident being called for your patient. That's your patient's sodium concentration is now 120 milli equivalent per liter. So something wrong went here because the body allowed the sodium to drop to 120. So what could have happened that led to this without any further information about this patient? So let's go quickly over the possibility that might have happened the first possibility and i always think of always you need to be careful is lab error the other name here pseudo hyponatremia i don't want to spend much time because this is a very rare condition nowadays because now we have newer lab techniques to check sodium and avoid these lab errors now we have sodium electrodes electrodes in most hospitals, but let's say you don't have that. How do I tell if pseudo hyponatremia? First of all, this is a lab error mainly happens because there is too much triglyceride mainly or too much protein in the extracellular fluid, right? Here, usually in thousands, it's not like a triglyceride of 200, 300, 1000 and above. And here, usually, you see it above 10 milligram per deciliter and usually in multiple myeloma. So you can simply, if your patient does not have these conditions, most likely this is not pseudohyponatremia. But because the triglyceride and the proteins, they do not contribute to tonicity. So they do not contribute to tonicity. That means the tonicity here will be normal. And how do you tell tonicity? The measured osmolality and i'm gonna call it from now on mo is normal the calculated osmolality as, as you can guess because the sodium went down calculated osmolality i'm gonna call it co will be low which means now mo minus co will be increased and this will mean increase increase a smaller gap the bottom line here let's stop the Pseudohyponatremia is a very rare condition and unlikely you're dealing with pseudohyponatremia nowadays. If you are on suspicion, check do you have any of these conditions and check measured osmolality. If it's normal, most likely you're dealing with this pseudohyponatremia. Let's move to the other possibility, number two. What possibly also could have happened? Let's look at this draw. This is the extracellular fluid with the sodium in here. And this is intracellular fluid. Now, the other possibility is a substance, let's put it in green color, a substance accumulated in the extracellular fluid and led to increase tonicity, which means by default, as we learned of tonicity, that means this substance is confined now to the extracellular fluid and was able to create an osmotic drive and shifted water to this side. The total body sodium or total sodium in the extracellular fluid remained constant you have more water this will lead to decrease in sodium concentration without any change in total body sodium or sodium in the extracellular fluid so the reason for all of this is a substance that caused the dragging of water or shift of water and usually these patients they don't have you don't have to treat the hyponatremia specifically you just need to treat this condition and I forgot in pseudohyponatremia, you don't need to really treat the hyponatremia, just treat and it's just a lab error. They don't have symptoms related to hyponatremia. Now, in clinical practice, the main two possibility that could cause this increase in tonicity and lead to hyponatremia is one, hyperglycemia, as you could guess, and two, using mannitol. These are the main ones. I hope the green color you could see that now in hyperglycemia let me change the color maybe it's better in hyperglycemia 
What do you think the major osmolarity, osmolality will be? It will in, be increased major osmolarity because major osmolarity goes hand in hand with tonicity. So major osmolarity high means tonicity is high. And actually, if you want to calculate it, get a number, tonicity is simply equal major osmolality minus BUN divided by 2.8 because BUN does not contribute to tonicity whatsoever because it's freely moved in and out the cells based on its own osmotic gradient or drive. Okay, so with the hyperglycine, we have increased tonicity, increased major osmolality. How about in calculated? The calculated osmolarity will also be up because glucose contribute to calculated osmolarity. So that means there is no increase in osmotic gap. It's called OG. Once we understand things, things make sense. You don't have to memorize. And as you know, probably we'll come to that later on when we give the examples. Every 100 milligram of glucose above 100, you subtract insulin, uh, sodium by 1.6 milli equivalent, and I think 2.4 if it's above 4 if for every 100 above 400. So simply the treatment is you treat the hyperglycemia. This does not happen with mild hyper, hyperglycemia or euglycemia because the glucose readily absorbed into the cells. Now mannitol, which we rarely use nowadays, it's confined to the uh, extracellular fluid and able to drag water here so it caused the same thing the only difference between the mannitol and hyperglycemia you will have increase in tonicity and major osmolality right but you have low calculated osmolality because sodium is low and mannitol does not contribute to calculated osmolality so we will have increased osmolar gap treatment as i said treat the underlying problem stop mannitol so this is another possible let's move to the uh, another possibility here the third possibility that this sodium concentration is low you have water here no problem but you have very low solute intake that you're you have really low total body sodium now or ACF sodium because your daily intake solute is very low so what's gonna happen the body try to excrete that water, extra water that fail to keep that range. But the low amount of solute intake can affect our ability to produce that much urine. So the lowest urine osmolality you can produce is around 60 milli small per liter. And our daily solute intake is from 600 to 900 milli small normally. Let's say our daily intake 900 milliosmol. Based on this, you can produce milliosmol, 60 milliosmol per liter. Let's go with this. And this equals 15 liter of urine. That's with normal intake. Now, if this, let's say to, for the sake of make it simple, your intake drop to 250, this will be 250 multiplied by 60 and this will become 4 liter of diluted urine because you need to produce that diluted urine get rid of more water to keep sodium concentration now if you're producing 4 liter of urine uh, uh, diluted urine and drinking drinking 5 liters of water of course your sodium concentration will decrease now we'll have decreased sodium concentrations and here you will have decrease in tonicity a true decrease in tonicity and both a smaller decrease a smaller uh, measured osmolarity decreased calculated osmolarity and no change in osmolar gap all right a hypotonic a true hypotonic hyponatry now where possibly we could have this if somebody just eating tea and toast for example you've heard of tea toast diet where mainly they they have water and uh, they lack no protein and no sodium chloride also the other possible is beer automania beer drinking too much beer doesn't have solutes loads and it has a lot of water it has carbs mainly but carbs doesn't help with the tonicity or solute loads so that will lead to this so we have hypotonic hyponatremia and the because the body tried to dilute urine the urine osmolarity is decreased low urine osmolarity we'll come to that one thing i want you to pay attention to that is 
Rarely you'll find a single factor causing hyponatremia, usually multiple or at least two factors contributing to that. And we come to the examples, you will see how is that um, really in clinical practice. Let's move to this next possibility that what could have happened that sodium low, of course, now once we know all of that, we'll rely on our physical and history to and work up to decide which one we have. Number four, let me draw this picture again. Okay, how about you having sodium here and now you start drinking too much water, a lot of water. And the body, of course, sensing that the increased ton uh, decreased tonicity. So there is decreased tonicity and the body is sensing that and start switching off ADH. Suppressing ADH allow more diluted urine. And the body is very good. Or the body can produce up to maybe 13, 14 liters of diluted urine at maybe 50 or 60 millisimol per liter. But if you exceed the body capacity to dilute urine, you will start developing this hyponatremia. But in most cases, what happened that the body is still able to adapt and then you have another problem that switched on ADH for a reason or another and then this the hyponatremia will develop. But let's say it's a, we, just a pure drinking water, you have to drink large amount, maybe more than the 13, 14 liters a day or even higher to develop hyponatremia. So this is hypotonic hyponatremia because there is decreased tonicity, right? Decreased tonicity means decreased major osmolarity. There's decreased calculated osmolarity because sodium is decreased. So there is no osmolar gap. Where do we see this? Mainly in psychogenic polydipsia. Now psychogenic polydipsia, a lot of these patients taking antipsychotics and these antipsychotics can in in trigger, inappropriately trigger ADH release. So even if not drinking that 20 liters a day, if drinking 10 liters a day and you take a medication that will trigger the ADH release that can lead to hyponatremia. So that's another possibility. Let's move to another possibility. We're still trying to explain without knowing anything other than the sodium level, what could have happened and caused the sodium to drop. Okay, now maybe everything was good, but the body failed to do something here that will get rid of excess water because the hyponatremia, as we said, that means there is excess water and the body failed to excrete excess water. How do we mainly, the major organ to help us uh, excrete or get rid of excess water is through the kidney. So let's see what could have happened at this level that could have resulted in, in that hyponatremia. The glomerulus, if the kidney, as you know, to produce diluted or concentrated urine, you need a GFR, a good GFR, right? So if you're not producing, um, if you not have a good GFR, you're not gonna have that filtrate, and you're not being, being, you're not going to be able in hyponatremia mainly to produce diluted urine. So if you have an advanced chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease, and especially, especially if GFR drop below 15 to 20, you will have a problem producing diluted urine, and you will have a risk of inability you will not be able really to excrete excess water. So drinking any amount of water at that point can cause hyponatremia. So that's a possibility. A C advanced CKD only when the GFR is that low and in the stage of renal disease. So that's a possibility. The second possibility, we said the water gets absorbed in two places. One of them is the proximal tubule, PT. Remember we said here we uh, absorb glucose, amino acid, and sodium and sodium drag water with it. So if there is anything that will increase the absorption of sodium and consequently increase the absorption of water because it followed the osmotic drive, then that means we are retaining more water. What could possibly cause this process of absorbing more water in the proximal tubule? The main and strongest one is volume depletion and mainly intravascular. And the prominent one are vomiting, but any case of volume depletion, so vomiting. And the other prominent one is liver cirrhosis and heart failure because the intravascular or the effective circulatory volume is low. So they will lead to increase in the absorption of water and retaining of water that can affect or impair the excretion of water and can 
uh, develop uh, contribute to development of hypogonadal treatment. Then what's that's another possibility? How about here? We said the these are impermeable to water, right? And we said this pump here mainly gets sodium, potassium, and two chloride to produce the hypertonic uh, medullary, and this mainly function to concentrate the urine. So you can sense that problem here should not produce hyponatremia because it's mainly related to concentrated hyponatremia. What's going to produce hyponatremia is the, uh, the, the lack of ability to produce diluted urine. And the pump that mainly responsible for that is this one. And this one usually blocked by loop diuretics. That's why it's not common to see hyponatremia with loop diuretics unless if they cause over diuresis mainly and volume depletion then that will follow volume depletion uh, effect but here is the prominent one thiazide diuretics thiazide diuretics can block this and block the ability because this will take sodium and chloride here and leave diluted urine if you block this you will not be able to dilute urine the way you want okay so that's another possibility Let's see what could possibly happen. Oh, what's gonna have work here? ADH. ADH will open the aquaporin channel and allow water to follow osmotic drive to the hypertonic medullary interstitium. So if ADH is working, will allow more retention of water. So ADH can be appropriately or inappropriately released. And at anyhow, whenever we are retaining water, that can lead to water retention and inability to secrete excess water. Now there is, as we said, one of the triggers, there is osmoreceptors, which is increased tonicity, and that's appropriate. We need more water to be retained. And the second one is, this is the main one, is the baroreceptors. And one of the trigger baroreceptors in, in, in decrease intravascular space. So look here, when we have decreased intravascular space, uh, intravascular volume or pressure we having two things here we're retaining water here and we're retaining water here here mainly water and here sodium and water and you can guess water water sodium only here what could have what could happen next so these are the main things and the other one is inappropriate that we have no problem with volume. Everything is good, but ADH being secreted and released and causing a retaining of water. So these are the possibility we could think of that somebody who present to us with low sodium concentration. I'll stop here in this video because I feel we gave you so much information. The next video will go over these things in a more organized fashion and in a more of a clinically oriented way. I'll see you next video.